Welcome, everybody. Hello. So great to have everybody here for this lunchbox talk at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Welcome to our friends on Zoom as well. We'd like to thank our lunchbox talk event hosts for this spring. At the dogwood level, James Jocelyn and Beth Hahn supported us, and that support goes towards program planning, accessibility, and reach of these programs. So we're grateful to them for that uh, donation. Now we get to move on to introduce our spe special speaker who is with us today from the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Chris Laloya is our curator for the Habitat Gardens here. And she um, is responsible for the care of our Habitat Gardens and also maintains the garden's carnivorous plant collection. She's knowledgeable in the cultivation of native plants and creation of sustainable gardens that are beautiful and brimming with biodiversity. So prior to joining our staff in 2000, she worked in ecological restoration in New Jersey and in South Florida, and she earned her Bachelor of Science from Rutgers University in Natural Resource Management, Conservation, and Applied Ecology. So I'm grateful to have Chris come up and share about gardening for joy and for the health of our planet. Okay, I'm going to do a little extra hello to the people from New Jersey and Ohio, because that's my family zooming in. Um, I don't think they've ever heard me do my song and dance before, so um, thanks for coming. Um, and thank you all for coming. And um, let's see, um, the bio that Joanna just gave to you, if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that there is no horticulture in that bio. Um, I have been here at the Botanical Gardens for a long time and learned everything I know about horticulture here, but I thought that I was going to grow up to do um, restoration ecology. And I think, you know, on some level, that's kind of what I do out here in the habitats, um, not in the way that I envisioned it, but that's sort of what I'm going to be talking about today. How do we garden in a way that restores natural processes and supports the um, biodiversity that we would find in less impacted areas than our own home landscapes? So joy and abundance are my stand-ins for biodiversity, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. As I, as I go through the talk. Um, okay, there it is. Um, okay, gardening for joy and abundance. So um, I think I gave all the bits that I needed to with this slide and we can move on. All right, so um, here's the abundance, right? Okay, so another thing that I sort of missed is that this is a native plant stock. You know, the basis of all of it is native plants and planting and abundance and diversity of native plants will encourage um, an abundance and diversity of all of the other critters that rely on them. I'm betting that um, most folks in this room are familiar um, with Talamy's work. You know, he was sort of the first one who really like, you know, proved this notion that um, native insects are relying on native plants um, for their resources. So, um, this is, you know, true, not just caterpillars, but across the board, native plants are the basis of these um, webs of life that support all the biodiversity around us. So I'm going to start off by talking about flowers. Flowers are providing nectar and pollen to lots and lots of insects. Um, the way you support biodiversity through flowers is you have lots and lots of colors and shapes and bloom times. Um, it's especially important to have things blooming at the very beginning of the growing season and at the end of the growing season. There's a lot going on in the middle. Um, and so it's not as crucial. It's always crucial. More is always better. Abundance, right? Um, but the top two images on this um, screen here are our earliest blooming spring ephemerals. So that is spring beauty and trout lily. These are plants that are blooming in um, February when the weather is variable and very often awful. And the, um, both of these plants have their own specialist bees. So we all know the story about um, how monarch caterpillars only eat milkweeds. It's also true that about 30% of native bees 
specialize on pollen from particular either um, plants or groups of plants in the same way that the caterpillars do. So we have these specialist bees that have their whole life cycles tied to um, these plants that are blooming at the most awkward time of year. And that's such a fragile connection um, and one that, you know, we really should be going out of our way to support. Um, you know, you look around and places that we live in don't really have these plants unless we plant them. You know, they're common in the woods around here, but it's not the sort of thing that's just gonna pop up in your yard. And you don't realize how important they are until you start, start to see the big picture. Similarly, the plants that are blooming at the end of the growing season, um, the golden rods, the asters, those are things that you see turn up on all of the lists of what plants are most beneficial for insects and other wildlife. So I'm going to mostly be talking about insects, but they're sort of a stand in, you know, for all of the things up the trophic level. So you've got, you know, the lizards and the frogs and the birds that are eating the insects and the caterpillars. So, um, you know, the insects, the native plants are the are the basis of it all. And then the insects are the next step. So, you know, finding picking plants that are going to support a diversity of insects throughout the growing season um, in a lot of different ways is um, is critical. So um, we've got the nectar and pollen down. Another way that native plants feed native insects is the herbivorous insects, usually the caterpillars that are going to turn into moths and butterflies are eating leaves. So that is a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar eating a pipe vine leaf in the top left. It's a very charming caterpillar, um, not quite as charming as the butterfly, which is definitely one of the showiest of our swallowtails in the area. Now, if you are fortunate enough to be in the mountains in the summer, you will see lots and lots of these butterflies because pipe vine is a very substantial vine that has big leaves and grows up into the canopy. So there's a lot of pipe vine for a lot of caterpillars to eat. Down here in the Piedmont, it's that Virginia snake root. So the picture that you see on the bottom left is the larval host plant down here. Um, it's about a foot and a half tall at best. Probably that's, probably that's an exaggeration and it's more like a foot tall. Um, if we had better light, you would be able to see the caterpillar in that picture. Um, but this is a plant that um, is, co is common in the woods around here. I bet a lot of you, those of you who don't already know that it's the host plant for this um, butterfly probably have never seen it, but you've walked past it lots of times. You know, it's likely that you'll have this. This just shows up in my yard. They tend to, you know, pop up singly. So one here, one there. In this picture, there's a big bunch of them together because I planted a whole bunch of them together at the bottom of the Piedmont habitat. It's really fun to watch the caterpillars come in and defoliate them. So another reason why you probably don't know, wouldn't notice it is the flowers are small and held um, down low. So it's, not a, it's never any showier than it is in this slide. Um, but it's a critical piece of supporting biodiversity. There are no pipe vine swallowtails in the Piedmont without this plant. And if we don't know that it's out there you know, to even care about, you know, how can we how can we help that situation? So there's another thing to think about. Um, you know, so many, the reason that I don't call, that I don't use the word biodiversity in this talk is one that I, I had initial reasons why I made that choice and I go back and forth on it a lot. But, you know, most of the time when we hear biodiversity in the news, it's pretty grim. There's very rarely any good news about biodiversity. All kinds of taxa are in decline. And when we think about the issues in the world, so many things, it's hard to um, see how one person taking a single action can make a difference. But one person either planting or just leaving an endodeca serpentaria in their yard can feed that one, um, that one caterpillar, make that one butterfly and make a difference. Uh, the other sort of point that I wanna get to with this slide is also Native plants produce seeds, um, grass seeds, or this is black-eyed Susan, sunflower seeds for the insects and mammals and birds that eat seeds, and then also fleshy fruits. There's a lot of different shrubs and vines that produce fleshy fruits that are great bird food. So I will be hitting on a few of these. Oh, and then the last thing is habitat. So um, things like um, pink muley grass, you know, everybody loves it. Everybody likes to plant it and grow it. Um, 
it's not providing a lot of resources for caterpillars or pollinators, but it is really, or it's not providing things for those critters to eat, but it is really good as are all the bunch grasses for creating a safe space for um, ground nesting bees to make their little nests. So ground nesting bees require some bare soil that they can dig in. Um, our native bees, except for the bumblebees, are solitary. Most of them are ground nesters. Some of them are cavity nesters. So the ones that nest in the ground need loose soil that they can dig in, um, in a place that's well enough drained that they're not going to get flooded out. And that um, the lower leaves of bunch grasses help protect them from the rain. So muley grass is valuable for that in that sense. Also anything that sort of maintains its structure in the landscape throughout the winter is valuable. Um, you know, you don't need to have a pink muley grass to have a monarch chrysalis. They'll make them anywhere, but isn't it spectacular when that happens? You don't need a pink muley grass to see in a null hunting. You can just look at the railing behind you and watch it happening right now in real time. Um, but it's a cool combination. So think also about the way native plants are feeding critters and also the habitat that they're providing. So here's that first slide that I showed you. Um, which I love because there are so many different stories, so many interesting stories in this. This picture wasn't taken in a garden. Um, this is coral honeysuckle and downy arrowwood. And this picture was actually taken out at the edge of our parking lot. Now, I don't wanna say that nobody, you know, I'm sure the choice was made again and again and again to leave these plants out there, but they weren't planted. These are two plants that grow together in woods all around here. Um, you don't necessarily get to see the honeysuckle bloom so dramatically in the deeper shade, but it's there. Um, so taking, one thing that I like about this picture is just taking a cue from the world around you, you know, seeing something that's happening in your area that you like and thinking, I can do that. Um, I'm lucky enough to drive down Jones Ferry as part of my commute and the butterfly weed has been spectacular this, um, this summer and I'm seeing it now blooming with the white topped asters and it's a great combination and it's one that we do here at the garden because you know we've seen it before and are inspired by it and these places um, you know on Jones Ferry as an example you know I've been living out there for 20 ish years now and just it used to be a very spectacular roadside and it more, more and more fragmented as more development happens. So we're seeing these um, lovely places where we can gain inspiration drop out and we need to find a way to include these plants and these lovely combinations in the world. So be that at our homes or if we can spread this you know, to local businesses, to municipalities throughout the state of North Carolina, throughout the United States, you know, uh, so on and on, we need to sort of build it out. But that idea of taking inspiration at home is a good one. Um, both of these plants are great pollinator plants. The coral honeysuckle with those long tubular flowers is a good um, hummingbird plant. Um, it has fleshy fruits that are consumed by birds. Um, the viburnum also great pollinator plant um, and has fleshy fruits itself. Um, they're both sort of average to moist soils, do well in the sun, can also tolerate more shade, just great native plant that people should be planting. So a little bit more about the honeysuckle here. Um, I took this picture, I was um, pet sitting for one of my neighbors and I stepped out on her deck and she had this honeysuckle growing in a pot which I thought was cool to begin with. And then it's growing up on this metal hoop frame. And I thought that was really cute. And I have to say that the people who are watching this on Zoom have an advantage to you guys because they can actually see these pictures. This is hard to see on the screen, but um, one of the fun things about it, it was all these little honeysuckle arms coming off, the, off this metal frame. So I'm taking a picture of it. And as I'm taking the picture, I see holes in the leaves. Like, well, what's doing that? And I look a little bit closer and the caterpillar up there on the top left is what's making the holes in the leaves. So here's an opportunity to talk about my favorite um, caterpillar reference, which is on the bottom of the screen there. I got out caterpillars of Eastern North America and I flipped through it until I found the right thing. And I said, oh man, that turns into the snowberry clear wing moth. So this is one of the sphinx moths that's day flying that we see around here pretty regularly. 
And it's just a really, you know, that sort of hovers in the air like a hummingbird. It's really fun to see. So it was nice to make that connection. And I didn't realize that um, the honeysuckle, which I knew supported, you know, pollinators and I knew supported birds, but also it's being eaten by insects. Um, I, I think I'll take questions at the end. Um, it's right there on the screen, Snowberry Clearwing. Yep. Um, so, so much good stuff going on. Um, also, um, for those of you who are not as far away as New Jersey and Ohio, but not in the Chapel Hill area, all the plants that I'm going to be talking about today are Piedmont, North Carolina plants, but I've included the map from um, Alan Weekly's Flora so you can see where else in the southeast um, they're, they're present. So, let's see how I'm doing with advancing. Look at that. Um, so one of the things that I like about that whole, there's so many things to like about that whole story, but she was growing it in a pot. We, I think, often think of pots as a place to grow our herbs or begonias. And actually, you know, if you don't have a bunch of space, if you are a renter, growing native plants in a pot is totally a thing that you can do. Um, when we first started landscaping around these buildings when they were brand new, everything was such an, in constant flux. We didn't have our deer fence yet. We got some big pots and we just took some things out of the nursery and we put them in the pot. So there would be something out here to look at. And we found that you can grow all kinds of native plants in pots um, quite spectacularly. So something as big as a longleaf pine, put it in a pot. Um, something as precious and delicate as an azalea. So the top left picture there is a pinkster flower and that picture was taken this spring. So that plant was in one of these beds and the original curator of these spaces for one reason or another, maybe we were improving drainage, maybe somebody was trenching a line through a bed. Um, she had to dig this plant up and she didn't know what to do with it. And she put it in this pot. And I can't tell you how many years ago that was. We never quite found the right place to put it back in the ground. And I've never seen like, you know, a, for, a, for a, an azalea that size to have that many flowers on it. Obviously it's not minding being in that pot. And so that's, a, that's an ins inspiration for like, you know, thinking about, okay, native plant gardening might be beyond my reach. It's totally not. If you've got a pot, you can make it happen. <clears throat> um, the Carolina lily on the bottom left, we've done so well when the deer don't eat them, growing um, lilies in pots out here. Carolina lily is the state wildflower of North Carolina, and um, it's not that easy to grow in the ground. I think that I'm going to have one blooming this year in spite of all of the ones that I've planted over the years, but they bloom great in those pots because they're well drained. Um, there's no competition. So growing native plants in a pot is a great idea. Things like the pitcher plants, you know, you can't really grow it in the ground because around here, because they like peat and sand as a growing medium. So a pot's the only way you can do it. So that's my digression to sort of say that if you, if you don't have a great space to garden in, you can still support this idea with a single plant and a single pot. So I'm going to talk about a few great small um, trees, large shrubs great landscape plants that also support um, some of our showiest butterflies and, um, and sort of harp on the idea that planting things that support the specialist insects also supports the generalist insects. So that's another way to spread the abundance around. If I haven't gotten to the joy yet, um, the joy is watching this zebra swallowtail flit through your space. So pawpaws, um, triloba is the one that most of us know as a pawpaw and is a, is a, you know, can be a 30 foot tall tree. Um, a simina parva flora is a dwarf pawpaw, very cute, um, less commonly available. But now that you know that this plant is the host plant for this butterfly, whenever you see a zebra swallowtail butterfly, I want you to look around. And it won't take you that long to find the pawpaw. Like the relationship is that tight. It seems inevitable to me that when I see this butterfly, I can always find the pawpaw nearby. And um, that's the caterpillar on the top right. Also very adorable. This plant blooms in the spring before it's leafed out. 
nice um, sweet smelling red flowers, sort of a invitation to think about the warm weather to come. Um, in leaf, it is dramatic and very tropical looking. And then there's the fruit. So if you've never had a pawpaw, people describe them as a cross between a banana and a mango. They're soft with big seeds, um, you know, about this big and um, a light green color. And you can't really buy them in a store because they don't ship. So the way to get a pawpaw is either go out to go out hiking at Mason Farm and find one there or plant a couple of your own. So great small tree supports not just the zebra swallowtails, but any other critter that wants to eat that pawpaw, including you. A uh, couple more. Oh, so the um, if you're going out to Mason Farm to look for pawpaws, look for them in the in the wetter areas. It's a it's a floodplain plant. Can take a lot of sun, average to moist soil. Um, also grows in the shade, but a little bit um, showier with more sun. And also, um, this slide is about spicebush and sassafras, which are both larval host plants for another one of our showy swallowtails, the spicebush swallowtail. Um, and that's the very cute caterpillar who is um, at this stage of its growth disguised as a snake. Don't eat me, I'm a snake. Um, early instars look like bird poop. Um, I don't know which one a bird would or would not rather tangle with, but they seem to do okay around here. Uh, and so these are also, you know, we, we're all familiar with dogwoods and red buds, which are great Piedmont native, small showy landscape trees, but there are so many other choices that do so many other interesting things. So the spice bush also blooms all three of these, like, like the uh, pawpaw, the spice bush and the sassafras also bloom very early in the spring before they're leafed out. The spice bush flowers individually aren't that showy, but collectively when you see all that yellow in a very gray landscape, it's very pleasing. Um, they have nice fall color, a nice um, golden yellow fall color. The females make red fruits, which are pretty showy um, at the end of the growing season and also used by birds. Um, it's another one, it's another floodplain species. So average to moist soil can tolerate a bunch of sun. Um, also does well in some shade. Sassafras is a little bit drier, a little bit taller than the other two. Um, the foliage is awesome all the time. Um, sassafras has blue freshy, fleshy fruits on red stems. So the fruits themselves are pretty showy, perhaps showier than the flowers. Um, the fall color of sassafras can't be beat. So these are great trees to include in the landscape and just a few examples of the great Piedmont species, great Piedmont small trees um, that we could be thinking about. Um, another, I think very underrated landscape plant is blueberries. So this is the one that grows around here, Vaccinium fuscatum, black highbush blueberry, because instead of blue fruits, it has black fruits. It has also very spectacular fall color. Um, at the, it has nice architecture, so it looks nice even when it doesn't have its foliage, but um, the, the picture that is not red is taken at the end of winter. So it buds up pretty early and you see those little pinky white buds swelling. And again, it's that like promise of spring. It's not, you know, looking at them, they're showy unto themselves, but they also sort of signal that it's not gonna be gray forever, or at least that's how I see it. Um, so black highbush blueberry and so many of our other um, vacciniums and ericaceous shrubs have really great fall color. Um, they're not that much used in, in landscaping. You know, they have fleshy fruits that are good for us or good for the birds or whoever else wants to eat them. And also um, this is one of the species that always turns up at the top of the specialist bees list. So here are a bunch of references. If you wanna learn more about specialist bees and what plants they're specializing on, um, this article, this pollen specialist bees of the Eastern United States is a good reference. I, don't, I didn't like copy down the web address, but you can easily find this with an internet search. So um, one of the guys involved with this, Jared Fowler, has created a really neat website called Bumblebee Flower Finder. So that's that second box there, that's the address for that. Again, easily findable with an internet search. So if you go to this website, 
you can either say, I want a white flower that will bloom in July in a dry shady spot and it will return and where, where, um, what part, where do I live? So his work is in the mid Atlantic. It doesn't come any further south than Virginia. So it's not quite our area, but very helpful nonetheless. So um, this website will kick to you a list of plants that fit that bill ranked by how valuable they are to bees and um, how valuable they are to specialist bees, how valuable they are to queen bees, how valuable they are to worker bees. It's all broken down. So you can either do it to find a plant or you can do it in the opposite direction. So if you were to go to the website and type in vaccinium fuscatum, this is the list of pollen specialist bees that you would come up with. So um, I don't know why it is that vaccinium and ericaceae are so important to specialist bees, but they are. And planting blueberries is a great way to support these critters. Um, there is another website by the National Wildlife Federation, so this is the reference at the bottom, that does essentially the same thing only with caterpillars. So um, if you type, you know, you can do it in the same, same way. You can either like say, this is a plant that I, you know, these are some characteristics of a plant that I'm looking for, and it'll rank them like these support the most butterflies and moss. Or you can say, what does vaccinium do? And vaccinium supports, a, this. the National Wildlife Federation website is also zeroed in on where you live. So you type in your, um, your zip code. But 237 species of butterflies and moths use vaccinium. It doesn't break it down into vaccinium fuscatum versus vaccinium corymbosum versus any of the other ones, but also a really important plant for the caterpillars and moths. So think about vacciniums. Um, other plants that show up at the top of all the lists, at those two lists, the uh, Douglas Talamese list is the goldenrods. And they produce a lot of nectar and pollen and they're flowering late in the season when those resources are more um, highly in demand. Goldenrods can be tricky um, to grow. Some of them are aggressive. Some of them are rhizominous and will spread like crazy. So here are four very good smaller choices. The tallest of these I think is the smallest goldenrod, which is, I don't know, three and a half, four feet tall at best. But this picture here is the Eastern gray goldenrod, which is really one of my favorites. Um, it's probably more like two and a half, three feet tall, very handsome foliage, um, very nice flowers, just a nice shape, very sturdy and upright. This picture was taken at the end of the flowering season. So the flowers are already fading and it still looks good. It's a great winter interest plant because it continues looking good throughout the winter. And all of these are clumpers and not spreaders. So um, very good choices. And I've got another one here. Um, this one is for the shade, axillary goldenrod. So I garden in the shade and there are very few things that bloom in the shade late in the season. So. I, I particularly love this one. I like it even, I like its foliage even when it's not blooming. Um, so think about adding goldenrods. Um, think about adding sunflowers. They're on the tops of all the lists. So um, out here in the Piedmont habitat, we have a couple, the, the two prominent sunflowers you see out in the Piedmont habitat are Helianthus divaricatus, which is the one that's in this picture. We also have small-headed sunflower, Helianthus microcephalus. Both of these plants are bullies. Um, if you have a lot of space and you can do like a big dramatic meadow garden, they are excellent. Um, when the goldfinches, when the, when the seeds of these sunflowers are ripening at the end of the season and the goldfinches come through, it's like watching a school of tropical fish fly by. And I said to Emily, I think probably most of you guys are familiar with Emily's photographs from all of our social media. And I said, I've been trying to get capture this for years and I have nothing. And she says, oh, I have one. So the, um, the goldfinch picture is Emily, but it's so much fun. Um, and it's so much fun to see how those plants are supporting the goldfinches. They're supporting all kinds of other pollinators um, and all kinds of other critters. Um, but they're not for the faint of heart. Two of them that are much better behaved, they're clumpers and not spreaders, are um, Appalachian sunflower, Helianthus atrubens is a smaller one, um, and narrow leaf sunflower, Helianthus angustifolius is a very big showy one, and neither of them will spread by rhizomes. So um, good, good garden plants if you don't have room to 
to go all the way. Uh, another one that you see all the time on the top of the um, of the best plants for biodiversity lists are the frost asters. And I have to admit that it took me a long while to come around to this. So frost asters are great looking. They're covered with white flowers at the end of the growing season. Frost aster isn't a species, but rather just sort of a generic term for all for the group of uh, asters that have tiny white flowers at the end of the growing season. They produce a lot of nectar and pollen and they do it later than anything else. So they also take up a lot of space and they really do seed in. So they're a thing that need to be managed, but I was doing sort of a workshop version of this talk in November and walking around the garden the day before, just trying to get a sense of what I was gonna show people what we were gonna talk about. And um, a cold gray November day, I'm standing looking at this frost aster and I managed to take a picture of a fly, a bee and a wasp pollinating it. And I know that this is almost impossible to see. Let's see, if I carry this with me, I can kind of point. This right here is a um, chrysalis of a black swallowtail butterfly. So um, larval host plant is golden alexanders or other things in the APAC family. But all of this is happening on frost aster in November. So I really did come around in that moment. Um, one of the folks that used to work here uh, and does no more managed um, the strip between the um, sidewalk and the road out in front of our sign wall for a while by planting and mowing frost asters out there. So they will bloom spectacularly at a very um, convenient height if you can keep on them like that. So that's what I do in my dog yard now. Um, so, you know, they can take a little bit of work, but they're really worth it. And that is the end of the plant slides and it's 1238. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about habitat now. So that top left picture is um, bare ground with, um, it's in the Sandhills habitat where the ground is very easy for a ground nesting bee to dig in, but leaving some bare soil so that the ground nesting bees can make their nests. Having bunch grasses, um, leaving the leaves, the other side of the bare soil coin is the leaves, you know, at, in, the, in the fall through the winter, those leaves are the repository of so many eggs and larvae and even overwintering adults. And then having structure in the landscape in the form of trees and shrubs and grasses so just sort of thinking about a garden space as more than just a place for flowers, but also a place that um, is, is critical for providing habitat. And then of course, um, you know, winter interest is habitat. So thinking about um, design choices, you know, I, I like to talk when I'm talking, when I'm giving a plant talk, I like to talk about what a plant looks like in winter, because, you know, if you have plants that are there providing that structure, that's where all of those critters are hanging out over the course of the winter anyway. So you get to have something to look at. You know, the colors aren't quite as dramatic as they are in June, but there's color and texture. Um, you know, traditional gardening would have you take all of this stuff down and clear it all out and have everything tidy and mulched for the winter, but that is no way to support life. And I think that we also personally can find more joy in looking at a landscape like this rather than something that's mulched. So hiding out in those spaces are, you know, the green link spider and all of her little babies. And I don't, this is tricky to see, but if you look behind the mama there, there are lots of tiny little spiderlings in that shot. I think, that, so this is, um, um, what's it called? Rattlesnake master. And, uh, I think rattlesnake master might be the most photographed plant in the garden, not because it's the showiest, but because when it's blooming, it attracts so many cool pollinators, so many different kinds of cool pollinators. And then in the winter, it's still doing interesting things like supporting spiders. So that's a good one. Um, also, you know, in, in hidden in that winter interest picture are things like the larvae that overwinter inside galls, um, chrysalis is there's just so much stuff going on in there so leave it in place for as long as you can um, when you cut it back you know or if you cut it back some people might not actually have the need to cut it back 
I'm not one of those people. I wish that I was. Um, but at some point I have to cut it back. So you can cut it back with the stems to a foot or a few inches tall to provide that um, cut stem as a place for a cavity nesting bee. Um, here's the here's the point in the season when we're starting to think about like, yeah, I probably want to cut it back and make space for the the green things that are coming in spring. Um, I will also say that another downside, you know, I I I worry a lot about the critters that are hanging out in in the litter and in the stems. Um, and so with ferns and with perennials, um, I leave as much in place as I can. It can get me into trouble in situations like if I have four years of fern fronds lying on the ground untouched and the poison ivy vines are tangled up in those fern fronds, it can be hard to deal with. In that situation, what you can do is just take the stuff and make it smaller and leave it in place. So chop up the ferns or chop up the perennial stems and leave them in place. But um, my other solution was um, brush piles. So inspired by, I'll take a step back and say that I live in the woods and I'm always picking up sticks. And rather than just make a pile of sticks or do something else with them, like burn them, I started making Andy Goldsworthy inspired, um, I like to call them Andy Goldsworthy brush piles. So it's just a brush pile, but it's very intentional. Not quite as curvy as this, but curvy enough to make me happy. Um, but if you're not familiar with Andy Goldsworthy, he's an artist that uses uh, mostly natural elements or maybe all natural elements to create beautiful works of art. So he can inspire, he can inspire creative maintenance solutions <clears throat> in one way or another. Um, so I would do this with my, my brush piles at home. I started doing it with perennial stems. So my Andy Goldsworthy brush piles became piles of perennial stems that were sort of winding through the backs of beds or around trees. And from there I escalated and I started building little fences. So this example of a little fence built with perennial stems is um, just a bunch of cut stems laid between two sets of um, uprights. So just laid in there, um, you can add more as the years go by, the, both the um, holes in the uprights and the holes in the horizontal stems are potential nest sites for cavity nesting bees. You haven't gotten rid of any eggs or galls or you know any of the, the critters that were potentially in those stems. It allows them to decompose in place and return all of that organic matter to the soil. Makes me feel a whole lot better. Um, and it looks pretty cool too. So I did it in a couple different ways. Um, this is the sort of stacked between two uprights method. I also started putting in single uprights and weaving the stems between them. The second method is a lot sturdier. It's a little bit trickier to add more, but you can just push it down from one year to the next and then just build the next layer on top. The word of advice that I have for either of these um, things is you need to sort of have a sense of how long the perennial stems you're going to use will be and make sure your uprights are spaced such that each perennial stem passes three of them. That's what it takes to hold the whole thing together. But very satisfying. Um, they, they prompt a lot of questions that I like to give the answers to out in the garden, you know, promoting, promoting maintenance for, for um, biodiversity. Here's another one that I did um, thinking that maybe the bees would be happier with more horizontals. And I will admit that I have never gone back and actually watched to see how well they're being used by bees. But if you do look at them from year to year, I can see they're definitely being used by insects in lots of different ways. So even if I'm not creating the ideal bee habitat, I still feel pretty good about the project. This one is actually a little built frame um, to hold the uprights in place and just um, stuck in the ground. Um, and we took our show on the road to Washington, D.C. a few years back and built a um, native plant garden of Piedmont plants um, with our very own Chapel Hill grit pads. And I built a fancy one up on the National Mall. This is my 15 minutes of fame, um, my waddle on the National Mall. So this, I think, I think I just put it in there to show off a little bit, but also you can see pretty clearly in this picture how it's done. Um, and to go back to the brush piles, um, 
as I've said, I escalated with the wattle fences, then I kept escalating with the brush pile. So how do you use all of these branches that are falling in a way that creates habitat, but is still neat and tidy and aesthetically pleasing? And I think there are a million ways to do this. And I spent a lot of the early pandemic sleepless nights thinking about this. And I came up with this little sunburst idea. So, you know, unlike, um, oh, I can't think of his name. The guy that made the um, super cool stick sculpture, Patrick Doherty, we had that great stick sculpture. So he's using fresh material. It's very bendable and pliable and he does amazing things with it. But my goal was to take the material that's already fallen. So you really don't have that pliability. You don't get to decide how long or what shape anything's gonna be. So building this little sunburst, this little sort of like um, shape on the ground, you can keep adding things to it. I built a little frame underneath so it's lifted a few inches off the ground. So there's a good space for any critter that wants to tuck in there to get in and out. Um, so that was one idea. I built a bird nest that work study student Marin was kind enough to pose in. And then I started farming the idea out. So I got another work study student to build this thing. And she really like took it to the next level. Inspired by the planetary symbol for Earth, she made these compartments that she thought we could fill with different things like pine cones or different colored leaves. Um, my volunteers built another fun one out in the parking lot that doesn't actually have its own interpretive. But um, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm taking this to, I don't know if it's the next level or where I'm taking this, but this is what I'm doing now. <laughs> Um, when, uh, when some friends of mine, the Tildens, who some of you guys definitely know, um, saw the description of the talk, um, they sent me their brush pile that, that door there is the possum door to allow the possum to go in and out. So infinite possibilities, but the idea of keeping this stuff on your site, allowing the insects that that eat the wood and decompose it to do so in place, allowing the organic matter, matter to return to the soil, feeding all of the birds that like to eat those insects. Um, and my last example here will be the dead tree example. So um, we at the garden have in the past not always cut trees all the way down. If you cut it to four feet tall, it's a nice, height to set your coffee on, but you can also allow that stump to rot in place. Um, the line that I used when I was writing the interpretive, I was asked to explain why, why are these stumps rotting throughout the garden? So I wrote an interpretive and the line that I used said something like, sometimes it's inconvenient to leave a standing dead tree in place. And that just tickles me because I live in the woods and it's really not inconvenient. But the fact that I can casually say, sometimes you might not want to leave a standing dead tree. So in the event that you don't want to leave a standing dead tree, a high stump fulfills many of the functions. You don't get the crows sitting up on top in the morning, but you get all of those um, critters that are eating the wood, breaking it down. Um, and this spring we had a Carolina wren. So that's the picture on the right. You can see mama wren peering out of the nest. So like within inches of the path, at eyeball height for all of the kids that came along. We had a mama wren and five-ish noisy baby wrens in there. And it's like the picture, you know, here's the, here's the biodiversity poster children right there. So um, similarly, you know, putting salamander logs by the, by the salamander pool and some of the vernal ponds in the mountain habitat. Just sort of thinking about these natural ecological processes, how we can incorporate them into our own spaces that are not the woods um, in a tidy way, in a meaningful way, in a way that brings you joy and supports all of the other critters that desperately need our help. So that um, came in under the wire and that's what I have to say and um, Here's my email address. If you have lots of questions about how to build a wattle fence. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. Um, it's my last name at email.unc.edu. But um, L-I-L-O-I-A. You can also find it on the NCBG website. Uh, one last plug, some of these plants that I've been talking about are for sale right outside in the 
in the uh, plant sale area. Questions? Thank you so much. And we have a little bit of time here for some questions. I know there are a couple online. David, if you want to read one of those, I'll take some hands here and walk towards folks. And this is my microphone in my hand. <laughs> You provided a great segue into some of the questions that we had. Um, they were about sourcing native plants. Um, one participant wants to know about sourcing trout lilies, if you have suggestions, or do you know if they're hard to transplant? Um, I don't know if they're hard to transplant. Um, you know, we don't want you to go dig them up from the wild. We do, we do regularly sell them here at the Botanical Gardens plant sale. Um, one place that you might look for information on local North Carolina native nurseries is the um, North Carolina Native Plant Society's website. They have a nice list. We're working on our own list, um, but their list is, is quite up to date. So that might be a, a good place to look, but um, definitely start by checking us out because I know it's a thing that we work on here. Um, it used to be that we, um, Used to be that we would start the daily plant sale in to time to time or in time for the trout lilies to be blooming and on the plant sale. Okay, we'll take a question here in the audience. Yeah. Um, as a a person who is just starting to get into this, um, is there anything you would recommend? Like, if this weekend we wanted to go out and start working on this, like, is it too late to plant? perennials right now or is there sort of are there any resources for timing of when or is it sort of like just do it and see what happens um i you know this is not the best time of year to plant a thing and the reason for that is the temperature and the um unpredictability of rain so if you plant something now um you do need to water it. And if you're planting something delicate now in the sun, you might need to like give it a little bit of shade to let it get established. Fall is really the best time of year in our area to plant, um, but you could buy plants and keep them happy. And it's easier to keep a plant happier in a pot this time of year than it might be in the ground um, or sort of you know, it's a good time to make your plans and figure out what's the list of the plants that would work really well in my yard that would support the most specialist bees. Um, so yeah, it's a good time of year to be thinking about it. Thank you. That was a great question. And David, I think there's another one online. And are there any other hands in the room? I'll make my way to you. Sure. Yeah, there's one more question about sourcing on uh, native plants. Um, this person's finding it difficult to find uh, common native species that aren't valued as, you know, landscape or ornamental plant. Um, I, I did share our web page of recommended sources for native plants, but if you have any suggestions or recommendations for specific sites that can encourage a diversity of native plants. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a tricky question. Um, and it's one that comes up a lot. Um, we here at the Botanical Garden do try to address that issue. Um, but another way to get, you know, I, I think that we have sold that Virginia snake root before, but it's not one that we do all the time. Another way, um, you know, it's not the best way to get plants, but the North Carolina Native Plant Society, um, in situations where there is no hope, goes in and rescues plants that are going to be um, taken out by development. And that is a way to get your hands on some of the le less showy native plants um, that are less available in the trade, but also really valuable as um, valuable as habitat. I'm going to, uh, um, what was it? Oh, having friends, having conversations with gardening friends who might share that kind of stuff is a good idea. And Heather has something. I just want to put in a plug for the gardens uh, member seed program as well, because we do give away seeds for free to our members each year. And oftentimes there's things that are offered that um, maybe aren't the showiest, but also support um, biodiversity as well. So it's an opportunity to get some things that 
aren't normally available in the commercial trade. Yeah, Heather does a great job of including um, some of the not obvious great plants that people should be growing. Just wanted to plug the fall is for planting seal here every fall too. Yes, thank you for that. Yes, coming up in the fall, lots and lots of plants. And the, the next issue of Conservation Gardener is going to be about the difficulty that people are having, you know, sourcing native plants at this point. I think um, between the Audubon Society and Doug Tallamy really connecting the birds to the plants, there's been so much more interest. I think also the pandemic, people are spending more time in their gardens and it's a wonderful problem to have, but we all need to work on <laughs> making more plants so we can really support this movement. One more question here. Talk here. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you might have more success in getting more of this um, to show up in neighborhoods if you got a hold of the landscapers and changed their ideas about what places should look like. I know that a lot of it's homeowner driven. They'll tell the landscapers they want X, Y, Z. But if the landscapers were to have this vision and bring it to them, they would actually. Uh, where it's up to them and where they could convince the homeowners to do things too. So it seems like if you wanted to figure out how to get the maximum multiplication of effort, um, they might be the touch point to, to actually make it more widespread. The yeah, thought. that's a good idea. I know that there are certainly some people around here who are very much doing that, but they're in a minority. So we do need to get more people on board. And I'll add, we're partnering with the New Hope Audubon Society. I believe it'll be this fall and some classes for landscape architects. So they'll get continuing education and learn about native plants and planting. So, well, I think our time is here and there are no more questions in the audience. Your presentation has brought joy to me just being here and listening to you and seeing your wonderful sculptures. Maybe there's a book in the future ah, of your brush piles. piles. <laughs> we were calling so, them artisanal brush piles. Artisanal brush piles for a minute there. I love it. Gotta work so, on the perfect name. Well, Chris, thank you so much.